We've made the argument that slavery was, was positive because um, African Americans and people of African descent did not have the intellectual capacity to do anything else and needed to be this paternalistic view of slavery that they needed to be taken care of like children. And Douglas is arguing directly against that, right? He's using philosophy, he's using religion, he's using uh, Thomas Jefferson and natural rights and his debating skills and his oratorical skills and everything else, right, to argue against this idea, right? He's not the only person who's doing that. All kinds of African Americans are doing that at the time. Um, but Douglas becomes very, you know, the, probably the most well known for doing this. So all of this is wrapped up when we read these narratives. We have to think about all of this, right? That, that he's not just telling his story. He has a purpose for why he's including what he's including and why he's not including what he's not, why he's excluding what he's excluding. So the white abolitionists and primarily um, uh, made the argument to try to touch the hearts and minds. They're trying to win hearts and minds, right, through these of, of, of um, non-abolitionists in the North, right? That's the, that's the goal, right? And so you end up with this kind of standardization of the form when you read slave narratives, right? Especially in the 19th century. So you have this personal story and this rhetorical attack on slavery all blended together, right? It's, it's, it's a great propaganda tool in some sense is what it is. Not propaganda in the negative sense, just it's a, it's a, they're making an argument. They're trying to convince people that slavery is evil. And in 2021, it might sound weird to think you have to convince people that slavery is evil, but they had to convince people that slavery was evil. And you know, sometimes I wonder in 2021 whether we still have to convince people of that, right? Um, so if you look at these narratives, they typically have a, at the center of the account, right, the story, but they usually have a white framing apparatus. So like in the portable Douglas that we're going to read, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. He has William Lloyd Garrison, white abolitionist, has an introduction. And then Wendell Phillips, white abolitionist, has, a, has an introduction. And then Douglass tells his story, right? So this, this framing um, kind of to the white abolitionists, it, it gives authenticity. They're conferring their authenticity on, the, on these black authors, right? Um, telling the white audience, I'm vouching for this story in some sense, right? Um, I, I, I do think it's interesting that um, with my bondage and my freedom, or no, I'm sorry, with the life and times of Frederick Douglass later, the introduction is um, by the first African-American uh, graduate, I think, of Harvard Law School, right? He, he, he doesn't have the white abolitionists after the Civil War kind of auth authenticating his words. Um, so you have this, the abolitionist kind of giving the introduction, then you have the narrator, narrator um, uh, portraying slavery as this hell on earth, is what they're doing. So we'll begin to wrap it up here with looking at, at a couple of uh, Douglass's writings, right? So we have his narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. It's published in 1845. And again, Garrison has this preface, right? Um, saying that this represent, this is Douglas is kind of a uh, representative experience. And then Douglas focuses on the enslaved as, a, as, a, as an evolving person. Douglas, if you read his autobiographies, which you will, if you haven't already, he's always evolving, right? And that's what he's talking about. As Blight says, and I love this kind of image, Blight writes, we must imagine Douglas, the 27-year-old writer, sitting at a desk in his small, crowded apartment in Lynn, Massachusetts, in the winter of 1844-1845, drafting his first autobiography. We never want to forget that there's a person behind these words, not an icon. There's this 27-year-old enslaved, formerly enslaved person, runaway at the time. He, he's not free yet. He doesn't have his manumission papers yet. Less than 10 years earlier, 10 years earlier, he'd been fighting Covey for his life, basically, and now he's telling his story in this apartment by himself or with his wife as he's writing this story, right? We need to keep, remember, keep in mind the person behind the words that we're gonna read this summer. By my bondage and my freedom, he's beginning that move from talking about emancipation to talking to, about civil rights. He has his freedom at this point. 
he's technically free and he's not fulfilled. He hasn't reached his fulfillment living among the abolitionists, working with the abolitionists, because he doesn't have a quality, even among the abolitionists in some sense. So he begins his personal dedication to civil rights in the North, as well as continuing to agitate, agitate against slavery. It's this larger fight. He's beginning to crystallize this larger fight. And again, he's still um, 35, 37 at this point, right? He's still a young man. Then in 1881, towards the end of his life, he publishes The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, a larger overview. And it's one of the beautiful things about autobiography. As things happen in our life, our perspective about what has happened in the past changes. Right? So his remembrances, and not just that he forgets things or doesn't remember things, but his, his perception and his... Um, what was important and what wasn't has, has changed. And, and he knows how the story ends in some sense, or that he didn't know it when he was 27 years old. When he's 27 years old, he doesn't know that slavery is ever going to end. By 1881, he knows that slavery end, has ended, but he also sees Jim Crow segregation, right? And so, you know, his, his understanding of, of the past is shaped by his present. And that's why I think the life and times is so fascinating as well. So there are some resources if um, anyone is interested to, to read more about Douglas, and I hope you are because um, I'm so glad we're, we're reading the books we're reading this summer. Um, as I've mentioned Blight a few times, it's, a, it's an extraordinary biography that came out. It's 900 pages. Um, so I got it on my Kindle, <laughs> uh, which is great. Um, Douglas's three narratives themselves encompass more than 1,200 pages. Um, he also wrote fiction. He wrote a novel. He published his speeches. He was a prolific journalist. We won't be reading all of his writing this summer, right? Um, for the sessions devoted to Douglas's writings themselves, we'll be focusing uh, our reading, right? So in the first session, um, and Kathleen can, can verify this or we can talk about this, but um, we're going to be discussing the narrative in, in whole, right? And then selections from my bondage and my freedom, because he does have some repetition in that with the narrative and selections from the life and times. And we can compare and contrast and kind of see these. And then the next session, the, a month later, will be selected speeches, including What to a Slave is the Fourth of July and some other, some other of his great speeches. And then the last session will focus on selected journalism of his that a lot of times people don't think about with Douglas. Right? So I'm really looking forward to that um, this summer and, and um, some lively and enlightening discussions with whoever wants to join us. Um, there are some other uh, resources as well if you want kind of historians' takes on Douglas. And I included the portable Douglas up here because that's what we're using this summer. But the introduction by, the introduction by um, Henry Louis Gates and John Stauffer, those are really um, good to read as well. So um, thank you all very much and look forward to having our discussions this summer. Thank you.